Well, we're in session four of the book of Leviticus. And uh, as I think most of you have sensed by now, I've really looked forward to uh, tackling this book because it is so overlooked on the one hand, and yet it's so fundamental and so rich on the other. And uh, uh, the more we get into it, the more we'll sense that every detail there is not uh, just as a collection of ancient rituals that have no relevance to us today. Quite the contrary, they're very foundational. If for no other reason, than it shows us more and more about how God views things. And uh, we tend to take the grace that we have through Jesus Christ so for granted. We hear about it so much. It's preached off so often. We've come to embrace that uh, so much. It becomes so almost casual to us that along with that comes a casualness towards sin. And one of the things that Leviticus, I think, is intended to hammer into us is that God really, really hates sin. In fact, I would suggest that many people talk about becoming spiritually mature. How do you measure spiritual maturity? How do you measure person A versus person B? Which one is more spiritually mature? And I think one of the yardsticks that one might suggest is the hatred of sin. When you start hating sin as much as God hates sin, then you may be getting closer to the consciousness that he would have us have. Now, at the same time, of course, we're, we're subject to a genetic defect. We are sinners, and we're going to deal with that. But as we go through every, on every page of the book of Leviticus, the book of holiness, it's the, it's, it's, uh, some, some commentators have, just by way of review, they point out that they believe it's the most important book in the Bible. I, I tend to think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I understand their point of view, because it's the only book that really fundamentally focuses on God's holiness. And uh, in some very unusual ways. Now, we're in the first, what you might call the first major section of the book, which is about the offerings. There are six basic offerings. Most, most commentaries will say five basic offerings. I'm saying six because I'm including the drink offerings, which are actually mentioned in November in the Numbers 15. But um, there are uh, five plus the drink offering that were brought to the tabernacle altar. And each one of these teaches us something essential about Christ, both his person and the work that he completed on our behalf. You can generally lump these six offerings into three categories. The first three deal with the commitment to God, and they really really focus on Jesus Christ. The burnt offering, fundamental to them all, and the grain or meal offering. Now, there's lots of confusion, of course, that we've gone through because King James calls it the meat offering, but the word meat was used in a much broader sense than we use it today. And it'd be more, it's more descriptive if we call it the grain offering or the meal offering for our, for our vocabulary. And by including the drink offering from Numbers 15, in that group we have the three to speak of commitment to God. Total dedication is part of what they address. Now, the following three of the six are really focused on the life of the worshiper. And they also express some uh, aspect of our relationship with Christ. The first, the next one, the next uh, uh, one that we looked at w- uh, was the communion with God, the fellowship offering, or called the peace offering in the King James. That leaves two of the six for us to, that remain for us to address, and we're going to address those this evening: the sin offering and the guilt or trespass offering. It's in King James; they call it the trespass offering. Another way to describe it would be the guilt offering and uh, the sin offering and the trespass offering. And it's this third category of these two offerings that are subject tonight. The sweet savor offerings, as they're sometimes called, the earlier ones, set forth the person of Jesus Christ. These uh, last two, sometimes called the non-sweet savor offerings, speak of the work of Christ on the cross on our behalf. Now, it may sound like we're splitting hairs here. Actually, to, if, if one can really get caught up in the subtleties of the definitions of all the words. And, and much, on the one hand, there's some important distinctives to be made. On the other hand, you can also split hairs in a number of areas. I'm going to try to strike a balance between those two extremes. But uh, we have here the sin offering, first of all, which speaks of the nature of sin. 
And we're going to contrast that later with the trespass offering or guilt offering, which speaks of sin as a, a specific act. You'll discern as we go, especially in the bridge between those two, that some of those distinctions are a little bit arbitrary. They actually they overlap quite a bit, and many commentators tend to uh, blur the distinctions between them. So if you get a little confused, you won't be alone. Uh, they're, they're very, very close in their nature. Well, speaking of nature, man is a sinner by nature. And he is also a sinner because of what he does. It almost becomes a chicken and egg situation. You're a sinner because you sin, but you sin because you're a sinner. Now, I think all of us embrace the idea that we're sinners because we sin. Boy, you did this and that and whatever, and that makes us a sinner. Tragically, it's much deeper than that. I love the way Chuck Smith sometimes summarizes it. A man is not a horse thief because he steals a horse. He steals a horse because he's a horse thief. And that somehow gets it across a little a little further. Anyway, let's jump into Leviticus chapter 4. It's the first of the two. We'll take two chapters tonight, 4 and 5. And chapter 4 is the sin offering. Now, the sin offering is distinctive from all of them in several ways. And it's, it's clear that it's very, very important. We've emphasized from the beginning the burnt offering because it's fundamental to them all, and we spent quite a bit of time on that one a whole evening. But in this case, we have the sin offering. The account on about the sin offering is twice as long as any of the others. The, the burnt offering had 17 verses. The, the meal offering had 16 verses. The peace offering had 17 verses. The trespass offering we're going to get to will have 19 verses. The sin offering has 35. So just as that crude yardstick, uh, as crude as that might be as a yardstick, it tells us that the Holy Spirit thinks this is pretty important. It also is an entirely new offering. There is no previous record of anything like it anywhere. No heathen nation had anything even similar to it. Many of these offerings were, in some respects, emulated by pagan nations. They had offerings, they burnt sacrifices, stuff in quite different ways. But there's nothing that nothing that the scholars have found that even um, emulates, simulates, what have you, the, this peculiar offering. And uh, from the giving of the law in Exodus 20 onwards, um, it became the most important and significant offering. Probably because the giving of the law revealed its necessity. See, the real purpose of the law is to reveal sin. One of the startling discoveries you make when you plunge into the book of Romans is the law was given that we might sin more. And uh, uh, Paul actually says that and, and uh, um, because uh, to demonstrate the real nature of sin. And it, it certainly it's, it's one of its primary purposes is to reveal to us the need for uh, a remedy for sin. Now this, the sin offering here is, it was uh, offered at all of the feasts at Passover, Pentecost, trumpets, tabernacles. And it uh, was not only offered on Yom Kippur, it was the offering that enabled the high priest to enter the Holy of Holies. That one, once, only one time a year on Yom Kippur, did the high priest was he allowed to go in the Holy of Holies. And it was, uh, that part of the dynamic was the, uh, the, the sin offering. Now, it was in contrast to the burnt offering, although it was made in the same place, the burnt offering tells us who Christ is. The sin offering tells us what he did. They draw that distinction. In the burnt offering, Christ meets the demand of God's high and holy standard. In the sin offering, Christ meets the deep and desperate needs of the sinner. So one is looking up and the other looking down is one, one sense of it. The burnt offering was a voluntary offering. The sin offering was commanded. The uh, burnt offering ascended. Everything sent, everything went up in smoke, as you recall. The sin offering, everything is poured out. Again, one goes up, one goes down. So some people argue that in the burnt offering we see the preciousness of Christ, and in the sin offering we see the hatefulness of sin. Well, let's just jump in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and it goes on, this is, that phrase characterizes book. Often God spoke through the prophets or through a prophetess or what have you. Book of Leviticus is quite distinctive in that almost the entire book is a quote, a series of quotes by God to Moses directly. And uh, so God spake unto Moses, saying, 
speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning the things which ought not to be done, and shall do anything against them, then it goes on. The emphasis of both these, both the sin offering and the trespass offering, are sins of ignorance. Sins that, and now you say, gee, well, what about the sins that are deliberate? <laughs> the sins that are deliberate, they were taken care of. They, they were subject to death. You overlook that. See? So the, we're talking about here are sins that can be remedied. The ones that can be remedied are the ones that are done through ignorance. That doesn't mean they're innocent. They're still guilty. Payment had to be made. But here's the provisions. These are the provisions that have been made. And... Uh, See, if a man sinned willfully and deliberately, this offering didn't do anything for him. This was just for those that were inadvertent. The distinctions we'll make as we get in there, manslaughter versus premeditation, they're quite different. Remember Hebrews 10.28, he that despised Moses' law did what? Anyone? Died without mercy under two or three witnesses. There's no salvation for anyone that rejects Christ. Hebrews, uh, in that same passage, Hebrews, it said, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain and fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now, one aspect of this uh, that I think is worth highlighting is that sins of ignorance, the fact that they had to be paid, the fact that they're sins of ignorance, reveal a very fundamental truth. How many of you recognize the reality that we can sin by ignorance or oversight? See, sir, man? Do you know what you've just also certified? Is that man is sinful by nature. You see, that wasn't something you learned. Sin is something that can happen through oversight or ignorance. In other words, sin is more fundamental. It's not an adaptation. You don't, you don't have to teach kids to lie. You don't have, you know, when you bring, raise the kids, it's interesting, you realize right away their basic instincts are something they need to rise above. And, uh, through training. Man is a sinner by nature, and God's attitude towards sin has never changed. That's one thing that, uh, I, I've thought a lot about trying to figure out how to get that across. And I don't know how to do that. Uh, as you read through the Scripture, you find God's fiery indignation again and again against sin. But we tend to think, well, that was the old days. We're in the days of Christ. No, God hasn't changed. He hates sin now just as much as He hated sin several thousand years ago. He also happens to love us so much that He's provided a remedy that is so available to us that we tend to get a little careless, tend to take it for granted, take, tend to... to uh, 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 not focus. And that, that's part of what Leviticus should try to remedy here. But this conviction uh, of man's sinful nature pervades all of literature. When I was in college, we had a course in literature, and the primary theme of the course happened to be the role of guilt in the major classics. Whether you're reading Brothers Kar Karamazov or whatever you're reading, the great classic literature, one of the great themes it tends to deal with is the role of guilt, its corrosive effects, its, its irreconcilability and so forth. As, and uh, the whole deep guilt complex uh, pervades uh, uh, our entire consciousness, whether we admit it or not. And the real thing to realize it, uh, is that the field of science, specifically in the field of behavior, call it psychology, psychiatry, that general field of behavioral sciences, has no ability to deal with the biggest problem that human nature has. Any, any competent observer will tell you one of the biggest problems in people, people's predicament, is the role of guilt. They do all kinds of things to treat the symptom. They cannot deal with the cause, because the cause of guilt is sin. And it's intrinsic to our nature. So that problem is intrinsic to our nature. And uh, uh, psychiatry, psychology, the field of science has no remedy for sin. They can try to erase it, bury it, hide it, do all kinds of, they can't, but, but uh, um, they can't deal with sin. And the only remedy for sin is Jesus Christ. The remedy for sin are not these sacrifices of bulls and goats, except to the extent they pointed to, they anticipated, they, they amplified in advance the significance of that event on that wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. 
So what we need to do (laughs) is lie on the couch of Jesus Christ, not on the couch of our local analyst. And uh, that, uh, and what we need to do when we lie on that crouch is to cry out like the psalmist did, Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. The way everlasting. All through the Old Testament, David, search me and see if there's some... Reveal to me my secret faults. The passion, the pursuit of the, the man of God in the Old Testament and the new, is to discover the sin in him so he can confess it and deal with it. The sin is there, whether you admit it or not. And that's the Psalm 19, Psalm 51, there are lots of places we could go, but let's keep moving here. It's interesting that aside from Leviticus, God made provision for a man who through ignorance or rashness or accident um, messed up. God made that didn't excuse him, but there was provision made for someone who, through ignorance, rashness, or accident, killed somebody. As you may recall, in Numbers thirty-five, well, in, in, as you recall, when Joshua conquered the land, eleven of the twelve tribes were allocated geography, portions of the region that were allocated to Judah, Simeon, Benjamin, whatever. Not the Levites. The Levites did not inherit land in the traditional sense because God was their inheritance. So they they were treated differently than all the other 11 tribes. They were given 48 cities and certain definitive regions around those cities, the Levitical cities. Six of those 48, three on the west of the Jordan, three on the east of the Jordan, were designated cities of refuge. And uh, we find this, uh, I think, uh, I, I uh, pointed to this because it's an example where God is making provision for someone who inadvertently sins. When we think of the guilt of sin, we think of it as a, a result of a conscious act. Someone chose to do something wrong. No. You can also sin through ignorance. You can sin through an accident. You might have gotten careless and someone got killed because an axe head fell off your handle and killed a neighbor. Didn't mean to, but it was your fault in the broad, broader sense of that term. And we would call that episode manslaughter in contrast to what we call first-degree murder, right? In the Old Testament, God made a provision for that. <laughs> He's, he designated these six cities, cities of refuge. Now, uh, this is a dear example to me because I have shot my mouth off for many years, saying that everything in the Scriptures is there by design, deliberately. And furthermore, not only is it there by design, it always points to Jesus Christ. And I've had a couple of colorful examples where people have challenged me on that. And one of the places I got challenged was on the the, the, uh, cities of refuge. Because this is a weird instruction that we find in the Torah, in the the books of Moses. Because the idea was that if you were guilty of man... You found yourself guilty of manslaughter... Some guy got, you know, maybe you're in a fight and you hit him too hard, you didn't mean to kill him, but he's dead. You you didn't mean to. It was out of rage or accident or whatever. It's what we would define as manslaughter. By the way, see, they, interesting, you know, in Israel, ancient Israel, they had no police. You ever know what I'm saying? They had no prisons. It's a very interesting culture. And um, they, they made sure, God made sure they wouldn't defile the land by letting any of this continue. So how do they deal with it? Who was accountable to avenge the death of this person, the next of kin? He was called the Goel. He was also called the Avenger of Blood. The guy's brother or whoever, when heard about it, it was his commission, his mandate, to go after the guy that killed his brother. So you knew the Avenger of Blood was coming after you because there he's laying on the ground. What did you do? You hightailed it to one of the cities of refuge. Because if you could get to the city of refuge and convince the the, the, the people at the city gate, the city fathers, the, the city hall, if you will, that this was manslaughter, not premedicated, or you, you, you had that issue to deal with, and they gave you asylum, the avenger of blood could not touch you. You had to stay within that city. You couldn't leave that city. If you left the city, you were fair game. He might be laying out there waiting for you. But as long as you were in the city, you were safe. And that, that was, that's the deal. Except, there's another footnote in, in Numbers 35. And that is, 
that once the high priest died, you were free to go home and you were safe. Now, if you're a, a humanistic liberal commentator on this sort of thing, you tend to dismiss all this as sort of a quaint ancient tribal method for dealing with this problem. There's no way you can really relate this intelligently to what does all this have to do with the longevity of an official that's down in Jerusalem, you know, 50, 100 miles away, whatever. Uh, and yet when the high priest died, you know, <laughs> you, you, the, the, that was, that was, a, that was the, the big release, if you will, for the, uh, the, uh, any of these uh, fugitives that were hiding out in the cities of refuge. You say, okay, Chuck, what's that got to do with Jesus Christ? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Was the death of Jesus Christ premeditated murder or manslaughter? Well, from God's point of view, it was clearly premeditated. Because in Acts 2.23, it was, he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. That was his destiny. God planned it before Adam was created. It was, he knew it was coming. So from God's point of view, it's premeditated murder. But wait a minute. We're the, we're the people at issue here. How does, what, what is his death from our point of view? You and I. Remember what Jesus said in uh, Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they what? No, not what they do. So I would argue from that, that from our point of view, we can claim it's a manslaughter issue, which means we're eligible for the city of refuge. Who is our city of refuge? Jesus Christ, exactly. No one can touch us as long as we are abiding in Him. And all this was to endure until what happened? The high priest died. Who's our high priest? Jesus Christ. And when He died, what? We're free to go. We're released. We're, we, we have, we're, we're really, uh, we really are free indeed. And He, our high priest... Though he died, he ever lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. And 1 John 2 emphasizes, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Anyway, the sin offering that we're dealing with is intended to teach us that God must see ourselves. We have to see ourselves as God sees us. Psalm 32.5 says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. The great blessed refrain we're going to see as we go through uh, both chapters 4 and 5 is after all these rituals, they were forgiven. They were given full forgiveness from that procedure. So God will deal with man in equity, we'll discover. There will be degrees of punishment just as there are degrees of rewards. And different classes of people are going to be dealt with differently as we get through this chapter. We'll go through the priest and the, and the congregation as a group and the leader of the congregation as a group, the rulers, and then the individuals, and we'll, each one's dealt slightly differently. But it's the same idea. The first group, of course, are the priests. The priests, and it, it'll use the word anointed in here, so it's probably referring to primarily the high priest. We need to, as we, as we deal with this, as we go through this, let me alert you right up front, don't have in your mind the high priest that was in charge of Israel thousands of years ago. Indeed, that was what it's focusing on. But as we read this, let's realize who is the high priest of your family. You know, the believer. If you're a believing husband, you're, you, this, is, this is where the shoe pinches. You and I, as leaders, can be cherishing some idol unknowingly. Um, or you might be cherishing cherishing pride, like Hezekiah did in Isaiah 39. Uh, or we could be exhibiting blind zeal, like the sons of Zebedee did in uh, Luke 9. We also may be guilty of substituting labor for worship, like the church in Ephesus, which was very diligent doctrinally, but had no time for the king. Or we could be suffering that woman Jezebel to teach and seduce in Revelation 2.20. Remember that Ai could not be taken as long as the accursed garment was uh, in the camp. The mariners could not navigate to Tarshish as long as Jonah was on board. So we need to re-examine continually for secret sins, and that's all of us. So let's go and see what happens here. Verse 3, if the priest that is anointed, and I'm going to suggest you and I in our mind's eye, put ourselves in those shoes, 
If we do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. I want you to notice this is not for a a, um, deliberate doctrinal error. This is for an unforeseen, unknown doctrinal error that surfaces, say. In other words, these are things that come to his attention. Since he is the leader of the people, his sins get leveraged, as we would say it. If you and I might sin individually, well, that's our fault between us and God. But if you're a leader, a priest of the nation Israel, then when you mess up, they all mess up. And when you teach them a false doctrine and they follow it, they sin even though to them it's unknowing. Heavy, heavy stuff going here. So the sin of the priest is considered first because he was in the position of leadership. He he was to bring a young bullock. Now, this was the most valuable animal within their their culture. Uh, It was a a young bullock because his responsibility was the greatest and and privilege brings uh, with it responsibility. That's why James, in chapter 3 of the epistle of James, he says, My brethren, be not many of you masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. It's a very, very strange thing where when, you, when Jesus talks about why he teaches in parables. That seeing they might not see, hearing they might not hear. That sounds like, gee, they're being denied. No, they're being spared. Because Jesus knew they would not believe. And if they heard and understood and not believe, that's a far heavier sin than if they didn't understand and not believe. Given that he knew they weren't going to believe. You follow what I'm saying? It's a strange logic, but until you understand that, the, the passage makes very, is very, very strange, Matthew 13. Uh, anyway, let's uh, we could move on. Okay, in he, verse 4, And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head. There again, there's the transfer of identity, if you will. And kill the bullock before the Lord. And this, up till now, the ritual looks identical to the burnt offering that we studied in that first chapter. Verse 5, the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. The first step is to secure God's relationship with the offender. Seven implies completeness. Then the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet uh, incense and... uh, before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this is the place of prayer and the privilege of worship uh, to the offender. And uh, the horn, of course, uh, is a recognized symbol of, of power or authority. This is all, in a sense, the same thing that happens in 1 John 1.9, what some people call the Christian's bar of soap. If we confess our sins, that He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now the remainder of the blood was poured out at the bottom of the brazen altar. And this was to satisfy the conscience of the sinner and remove the guilt complex. This remedy for the conviction of sin was the only remedy that could ever satisfy the mind and heart. When Christ forgives you of your sin. He also forgives you. There's nothing more to be said. It is totally and forever settled. And as one commentator put it so simply, he is adequate. I'm reminded when I was uh, I was on a, a consultant to the board of Rockwell, I got involved with some of their human relations people. They always large corporations often have a, a performance review thing, where the person is unsatisfactory, satisfactory, or good, very good, excellent. And I always said, gee, after excellent, there's one more category they should add. What's that? Adequate. <laughs> and I actually published up, I, I mimicked up some performance reviews. I went through the thing, you know, from satisfactory, very good, excellent, adequate, as if that's, you might reach if you really, you know. Well, in that spirit especially, Christ is adequate, <laughs> complete, sufficient. And uh, now, from this point on, the sin offering follows the ritual of the peace offering or fellowship offering. Verse 8, you shall take uh, uh, off from it all the fat of the bullock of the sin offering, the fat that covers the innards, the fat that is on the innards, the two kidneys, the fat that is upon them, the, 
which is by the flanks and the call above the liver, the kidneys, and he shall take it away. As it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of the burnt offering. So all sin is forgiven, fellowship is restored, fat is burned on the altar, and fat you regard, it, it speaks of the best part. It was re- reckoned as the, the very best. But from this point on, by the way, there is a radical departure for the sin offering against all the other offerings. The remainder, see, they burned the innards on there. Okay, Now the remainder of this stuff, they don't burn there. They take it outside the camp from there and burn it there. Verse 11, the skin of the bullock and all his flesh and his head and his legs and his innards and his dung and his, the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out. Burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out, uh, shall he be burnt. So on the one hand, it's totally burnt, unsparing justice. But they're trying to emphasize the exceeding awfulness of sin. And there's nothing here that could be mistaken for consecration. It's taken out of the camp. It's gotten out and destroyed out there. And this points to Christ as our sin bearer. He's the one that was made sin for us. Second Corinthians 5.21, very key verse. He was made, we have no capacity to imagine what that means. That our pure and precious Lord, who was sinless on that cross, was made sin for us in our place. Now it's interesting that this happens about four miles from the temple. This is uh, outside the camp. When you look at Hebrews chapter 13, starting at verse 10, it says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve at the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp, that is outside the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, that is outside the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. How interesting it is that Jesus Christ fulfilled that at Golgotha, outside the city walls at that time right outside what we call today the Damascus Gate. Uh, It's fascinating to see how this all ties together. When you get to Genesis 22 and you realize that Abraham was instructed to offer Isaac, he did it at a particular spot, and he knew he was acting out prophecy. He named the place prophetically. But I don't know if he knew how specifically it would be that 2,000 years later on that very spot, another father would offer his son. And here in this, and then as we get uh, get into this whole thing with... uh, Moses and the, and, the, and, and the wandering in the wilderness and the, and the giving of the laws, that they have the sin offering so skillfully modeled. Again, this part, this aspect of it, outside the camp. Anyway, let's move on, verse 13. We're going to shift now. We've been talking about the priest. We're going to shift now to the congregation. Verse 13. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly... And they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty. When the sin which they have sinned against it is known, this is not something secret now. It was hidden before, now it's known apparently. Then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. Again, the victim is the same as before. A young bullock, the most valuable animal. The lesson here though is that in addition to individual uh, responsibility, there is a thing called corporate responsibility. God judges nations. And many people who didn't participate in the sin of that nation get judged with that nation. That's a heavy idea. You get get judged along with it. You know, that fascinates me to think that through because I've got good friends that are mature Christians who are staying in a liberal church because they feel they're called there to try and witness to it. You know, I've always accepted that until I studied this. And I, 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 my question to them now, if I get a chance to talk to them, is where did they get that idea? It's not in the Word of God. It's not in the Word of God. And you look at Revelation 18.4, Come out of her, my people, so you don't participate in their sins. 
It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a disturbing thing, and I want to, I want to, I want to tiptoe very carefully through this minefield. But if you're in a church that is knowingly not on track, you've got some tough praying to do. Because if that church is, for whatever reason, eligible for judgment, you don't want to be in that group. And my, my authority would be simply the Book of Leviticus, chapter five, four, uh, chapter four and five. Anyway, verse 15. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. Now, it's the elders, you know, in the name of the people that are transferring their collective national sin on that bullock. And I might say, I can't resist this, that the, it was the elders that also put Jesus to death on behalf of the people. Their act was a national rejection. You can argue that some scholars have argued there's as few as 13 people may have been guilty of getting Christ railroaded into that, to, to, into the death sentence. Whatever it was, it was. It was their, it was their official, from a national point of view, their official declaration. That does not make them, uh, uniquely accountable for Christ's death. His death is, uh, put at all of our, 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 uh, feet, if you will. Anyway, the rest of this, uh, is the same as for the priest. Verses 16. Uh, no one shall bring out the bullock's blood to the tabernacle congregation. He shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, that is, before the veil. And then he shall t- put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar and so on. He shall take his fat from him and burn it on the altar. And he shall do the bullock as he did with the bullock for the sin offering. He shall do with this. The priest shall make an atonement for them. It shall be f- and it shall be forgiven them. See, the good news about this procedure, this ritual, if you will, is that it ends it. Done properly in the right spirit, it puts a period at the end of the sentence, new paragraph, new page, new deal. It puts an end to the guilt that might attend all this. You shall carry the bullock without the camp, burn him as he burned the first bullock. It is a sin offering to the congregation. Then the next section takes the ruler. All are guilty, but the, uh, uh, but the responsibility is different. The, the reference here is to the, the civil ruler. When the ruler hath sinned and doth somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning the things which should not be done in his guilty. Um, it's amazing how our civil rulers are more concerned about the rule of the people rather than the rule of God. But they don't understand as God ordains people in civil leadership. And they have an obligation to God whether they know it or not. Verse 20, Or of his sin, where, wherein he hath sinned, come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. See, the kid of the goats is not as valuable as the young bullock, so we're going down a notch. It's interesting. Civil ruler doesn't have the responsibility the priest did in Israel or before God, either way. The rest is the same as the priest for the, uh, you know, uh, or for the private citizen. You lay his hand upon the head of the goat, kill it in the same place, and, and uh, it goes on this way. And get to verse 27, we have the common people, the individual. If any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he cometh somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, be guilty. Um, again, bear in mind, this all has to do with, uh, you know, uh, a sin through ignorance. And, uh, but yet, nevertheless, invo- involving a commandment of God. And by the way, his guilt cannot be established by hearsay. It takes, to, uh, his guilt has to be established with two or three witnesses. It shocks me, by the way, to discover how rare it is in the Christian body to apply the biblical procedure for, for these situations. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 18, has a procedure. If a brother has, if something gets to brother, you go to him first, and then with two elders, and then to board, and, and so on. There's a procedure. And it's a shock to me to see some uh, ministries that would proclaim to be very, very biblical that totally ignore this procedure in the administration of the responsibilities in ministry. They have pastors that uh, the, the, the landscape is littered with the bones of careers of, of guys who have been unjustly de- uh, 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 shredded through gossip that was unconfirmed. That isn't true. If uh, Just a, a modicum of investigation would have revealed this. They're right in this region. They're pastors that have been defrauded of their entire uh, several hundred thousand net worth by some of these procedures. There, there are uh, uh, pastors that are allowed to affiliate and pastors that uh, that shouldn't, and there are pastors that should be that don't. It's a, it's astonishing, and most of this all done by 
If you know, I happen to be uh, on the inside of a few of these things, and it just amazes me how hearsay is 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 the is the uh, the operating mechanic. Um, there is a dispute in Southern California with one of the major uh, universities. Uh, I, I should say a, a Christian uh, 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 university that happens to have a law school, where they frocked the, uh, on the on the basis of hearsay from a student. That turned out, that turns out not to be true, uh, was defrocked. And, uh, and the management, the regents or whatever they were, uh, felt that Matthew, uh, expressly uh, uh, indicated that Matthew 18 doesn't apply to them. And, uh, it just, uh, you know, uh, it's, it goes on and on. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pray through whether or not to go put a, put a uh, briefing back together on integrity in the body. Because it's a, a, one of the most flagrant abuse. I've, I, I'm sensitive to this issue because I spent 30 years in the boardrooms of public companies in this country. The occasions of a breach of fiduciary duty, as they would call it, was relatively rare. I only recall one or two cases in 30 years in, and in over a dozen corporations where that ever was an issue. And in the Christian community, the last 10 years being in what I'll call professional Christianity, it's happened three or four times um, just in a very, very narrow purview of these things. The, the ethics I experienced in the secular world are uh, substantially higher than I find in operative in the Christ, so-called professional Christian community. But let's move on. Verse 28, Or his sin, if he had sinned, come to his knowledge. He shall bring his offering, a kid of goats, a female without blemish for his sin, which he hath sinned. A female was permitted. This is considered in their culture less valuable than the previous offering. Yet an offering was required. See, he's down, down to the common people, so it didn't have to be a male without blemish. It had to be, a female would be fine. He shall lay up on his hand uh, the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering, and the priest shall take the blood there with his finger, and, and the rest of the procedure is pretty much the same. The important truth here is that complete forgiveness was secured by the sinner. The last phrase of verse 31, it shall be forgiven him. And this is exactly what was accomplished when Jesus Christ was crucified. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Boy, how important it is to understand that we are forgiven. Satan has two deceptions he plays on. First of all, that we don't need forgiveness. We're okay. And when we discover that we really are sinners, he'll swing it the other way. Well, he can't forgive me because I have these peculiar circumstances in my background. I'm sure he can't reach that far. Study the case of Manasseh, the worst king of all, blood border to border, terrible, terrible king. He re- ultimately repented and was forgiven, believe it or not. Anyway, and the rest of this goes on pretty much the same way through verse 35. Let's, in the interest of time, we'll just move on. Let's move on to Leviticus 5, where we deal with the guilt offering, commonly called the trespass offering. Again, we're dealing with specific acts of sin committed in ignorance or in inadvertency. The only really distinctive here is that here... It seems that the, 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 it's focusing more on specific acts that were private acts. There are many expositors, by the way, that still have not come to a conclusion as to what the difference between the sin offering and the trespass offering are. So if you get confused, don't be disturbed. Um, it seems, though, that the sin in the, in the trespass offering was more private and confided, uh, 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 in, uh, to the, uh, confined to the, uh, uh individual's, uh, uh, private knowledge. Some expositors treat the first 13 verses of this chapter, chapter 5, uh, as uh, uh, really part of the sin offering, the previous one. So if they seem to overlap, don't be surprised. And the word trespass in verses 6 and 7 we're going to discover can be translated guilt and should be his guilt. But let's move on. And, but and by the way, six, verses 6, 7, 9, and 11, the sin offering is required for the trespass. So don't... The, 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 it, yeah, I think if I was reorg, I didn't want to change the organization of this. I want to keep it conforming to the other commentaries you may run into. But I think if I was doing this again, I'd really put the sin and the trespass offering almost together because the distinctions are really subtle, and the procedures aren't that different. So let's take a look at it. Uh, we're going to treat this. We'll treat the chapter five as the whole thing as dealing, dealing with a trespass offering. And trespass really uh, means we most of us understand what trespass means, and the meaning is the same. It's an invasion of the rights of somebody else. That's really what trespass means here. People love to talk about liberty. They uh, go around parading and, and burning things and so forth. And they're free to 
swing their fists wherever they like, except their liberty ends where my nose begins. There's a point at which your liberty does not extend. When you, when minute you start to invade somebody else's rights, that's called a trespass. Withholding tithes is robbing God. That's a trespass against God. Malachi 3.8. Partaking of something forbidden is a trespass. Um, Achan took the cursed thing in, in, in uh, J- Joshua 7. Let's go in verse 1. If a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing, it is a witness whether he has seen or known of it. And if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Now that may sound confusing until you realize that what it's talking about here is that of ad- a swearing in the sense of adjur- an adjuration, like in a court of law. It has to do with the hearing of an oath and being a witness. One, what it really says is, if you're in that situation, you must tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The, the context here implies that in, in, you're an adjured and you're as a witness, you're not allowed to withhold part of the story. You've got to tell the whole truth. You see, you want to utter it. If you don't utter it, what you know about it, you're going to bear the iniquity. This is just a representative thing. There's going to be some other things here, too. It's going to deal here with the sins of omission. And James, you remember James 4.17, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And Solomon prays the same thing in 1 Kings 8. In his prayer of dedication, he has verses 31 and 32 where he, he uh, prays that uh, we might be faithful in this regard. And by the way, gossip, I believe, is the most painful sin. There are a lot of sins that are probably more serious in a lot of ways. Sin, all sin is serious. But gossip probably has caused more pain than any other of the lists of sins you can make. And uh, there's a whole addenda that I'll put in the notes. I won't go through that here. We're short of time. Let's move on. And one of the damaging things about gossip isn't that, as mentioned, it is incomplete. The great, one, of the great, one of the reasons it's so, hearsay and gossip is so dangerous, it's incomplete. You don't have the background. It might be technically true. I saw Dr. So-and-so carrying this young girl you know, into this place. You know, she's hit by a car and he's taking her to get served. You know, there's aspects to it that make it a heroic act, not something, I'm using a bad example perhaps, but the point is there's all kinds of events that you may see part of and look incriminating when in fact, if you have the old facts, it's totally night and day different. So one of the problems with gossip is that it's incomplete. It may omit the mitigating evidence or background. Anyway. And there's a list of this in Proverbs 6, 17. Let's move on. Jesus kept silent during his trial, as you recall, until he was sworn under oath by the high priest. There in Matthew 26, verse 63, where the high priest says, I adjure thee by the living God, tell us, and so forth. He did. That's when he did speak up. And he gave him, he nailed it. Verse 2, and if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of unclean cattle or a carcass of unclean creeping things, or if it be hidden from him, he shall also be unclean and be guilty. In other words, if you are not to touch a, a dead thing and you inadvertently stumble on one, didn't realize it even, you're still guilty. So this is the law regarding uncleanness. A dead body was considered unclean. Why? Because death is a symbol of sin. Sin came, a death came by sin. So something dead is by definition uh, unclean. The sting of death has sunk into them, as it were. Sin is proved to be there. How do I know? Because it's dead. Huh? You can't, you and I cannot be out in the world without becoming unclean. What we see, what we hear, what we touch, we are intrinsically unclean, independent of our choices. Proverbs 19.12, cleanse me, uh, cleanse thou me from secret faults. And yet, to comply with these things, trespass laws, you need to be specific. You don't say, Lord, forgive me all my sins. Generally, you be specific. They can be private between you and the Lord, fine, but they need to be specific. And that's what we have in view here, verse 3. Or if you touch the uncleanness of man. It's interesting, God, they distinguish between beast and man. Man's a whole other problem. Whosoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled withal, that it be hid from him, it, when he knoweth it, then he shall be guilty. And uh, this is just like verse 2, except it, uh, it's again man versus beast. And the penalty is more severe than for touching the beast. And that goes to Leviticus 11. We'll deal with it when we get there. And also deals with the deceitfulness of sin. See, the sin might be discovered later. You may, not have, you may have sinned and not know it. The sin can be very deceitful. You discover later, oh my goodness, I have leprosy. I didn't know that. Well, that's, you know, so it's uncleanness. Verse 4. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil, 
or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, he shall be guilty as one of these. The pronouncing with his lips literally <laughs> says is babbling with his lips. But uh, 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 rashly uttering a vow is what the context here. And of course, Jephthah is the example. After 46 years of comparative quiet, the, the Israel was apostatizing, and, and uh, at the time the children of Ammon made attack on them, and, and uh, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah and uh, summoned him to... Uh, to uh, he undertook the, the defeat of the Ammonites, delivered Israel rather dramatically. He was described, incidentally, uh, by the scholars as a wild, daring, Gilead mountaineer type guy, um, a sort of warrior Elijah kind of guy. Well, he made a very rash, tragic vow which involved the sacrifice of his only daughter because he spoke uh, rashly. It's a, it's a famous thing. You can look up uh, yourself in Judges 11. Verse 5, It shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things. Oh, just one key point about verse 4. One of the things I've noticed by the people in, in, in the senior levels of corporate governance that I've learned to respect is they're very slow to give a commitment. But when they gave it, they stuck with it. They would, if they, if, if the, my word is my bond, was their ethic. If they got into a deal and they could see it was going to be unprofitable, but they committed to it, they committed to it. Uh, uh, one of the great tragedies in modern, uh, I'd say at the lower levels of, of, of corporate uh, uh, strata, and also in in, in in many contemporary areas, is that uh, we've lost the sanctity of that kind of a commitment. My word is my bond. The answer is, so sue me, is the issue. What it's talking about here is when you give your word, you do it cautiously, but when you give it, you stick with it. It shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in the thing. And by the way, confession here is commanded for the first time. See, the other offerings were uh, open was open admission of guilt. This one has to do with specific secret sins. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for a sin which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of goats for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Confession comes first, then the offering, see? And this may be what the Lord had in mind on the Sermon on the Mount. Remember what Jesus said, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the author, author, altar, and then go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. You need to get that straightened out first, and then you, you get restitution first, and then offer the make your offering. You may confess your sin privately to God, but you nevertheless need to make restitution to the injured party. You may have sinned against them, the injured party may not even know it. Well, that's between you and God, not the injured party, as long as you, you make it right. Now, since this offering is for a specific act of sin, one of the many facets of the sin nature is that the value of the offering was not as great as the value of sin to the offering in chapter 4. See, this is more specific. In chapter 4, they were broader. You'll notice that this is a lower level offering because it's narrower in its scope, if you will. Verse 7, And if he not be able to bring forth a lamb, then he shall bring in his trespass. He hath committed uh, two turtle doves and two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Here the focus is on the sacrifice itself, not the offerer. Two birds are always required, one for a sin offering, one for the burnt offering. And the person and work of Christ is represented even in these poorest levels. But there's even one level poorer. Verse 8, he shall bring them into the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first and then wring off its neck from its head and did not divide it asunder. In other words, no, he kills it, but not, not, not a bone is broken. Verse 9, and he shall sprinkle the blood of the skin offering on the one side of the altar and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out of the bottom of the altar as a sin offering. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the manner of the priest. So he shall make atonement for him for his sin, which he hath sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then that sin shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense upon, for it is a sin offering. The poorest of the poor, in other words, were not left out. If he couldn't get even a bird, he could bring what was equivalent to a piece of bread, some flour. But no oil or frankincense. This is very similar to the jealousy offering that we'll encounter when we get to Numbers 5. And the intent was to present to the Lord the very person and substance of the offerer. It was defiled. That's why there's no oil and so forth. It's an omer, a tenth of an ephah. That happens to be the very quantity of manna that sufficed every day in Exodus 16 and so on. 
Verse 12, Then she shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it, even a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar, according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. It is a sin offering. The priest shall make an atonement for him, as touching his sin that he hath sinned in one of these, and it, sh- and it shall be forgiven him. And the remnant shall be the priest's as a meat offering, or a meal offering. Now we get into an area which I'll call non-specific trespasses. These are primarily fraud situations. They were invasions of rights of either God or uh, man, and reparations were required. We'll come into this a little bit. There are two kinds, fraud against God, like with respect to the worship of Him, or fraud toward man. Let's go to verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, saying, If a soul commit a trespass and a sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks, with thy estimation by shekels of silver, after the shekel of the sanctuary, for a trespass offering. And he shall make amends for the harm that he hath done in the holy thing, and shall add a fifth part thereto, and give it unto the priest, and the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and it shall be forgiven him. So he's got to make restoration plus 20%. Look at it as a double tithe. The basis plus a double tithe. Verse 17, if the soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord through, though he wist it not, yet he is guilty and he shall bear his iniquity. Ignorance, again, was not an acceptable excuse. It isn't today, even in civil law. Ignorance is no excuse. It's your, your, your diligence is required. You know who's the best example of this? Paul. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, Paul said of himself, who was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. His zeal for God caused him to sin because he was ignorant of who Christ really was then. Huh? He found out later that, my goodness, I've been sin- he's been sinning. He's guilty of that sin, even though he did it in ignorance, is the point. That's Paul's point, and that's our point here. Verse 18. And he shall bring a ram without blemish out of the flock, with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him uh, uh, concerning his ignorance, wherein he erred, and wished it not, it shall be forgiven him. The ram was the earliest form of recorded offering uh, pointing directly to Jesus Christ. Where did that occur? In Genesis 22, when Abram offered his son Isaac, a ram was substituted there. Verse 19, it is a trespass offering. He, he hath certainly trespassed against the Lord. And again, the ritual is the same as for the sin offering, except uh, uh, for the sprinkling of blood, which followed the pattern of the, uh, burnt, and pe- the uh, burnt and peace offerings. And we're going to explore some of this in more detail later when we get to chapter 7 for some other reasons. Now, most books, and I think we have time to squeeze it in, the first um, seven verses of chapter 6 are regarded as... Um, uh, a continuation of these trespass offerings. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered to him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or hath found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, or swearing falsely, in any of these th- things a man doeth, sinning therein, then it shall be, because he hath sinned, he is guilty, and goes on. These are business transactions. These all fall into a general area that you, would, you and I would call fraud. If he, uh, you know, if he lie, it's one thing um, about what he delivered for him to keep. Uh, I want you to care my, I want you to care my donkey, and you don't tell, you know, he has a defect you don't tell him about, and he get this. It goes both way, both ways. Um, uh, in which he was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship. The word fellowship there, by the way, in the Greek would be koinonia. It means in trust as a partner, and uh, or in a thing taken away by violence. Or hath deceived his neighbor. All these things are things that we can do overtly or even covertly. You can enter into a transaction which because of your clout in that marketplace, you're putting in undue pressure on the person making an agreement with you. And you may not even, and it's especially tragic when you don't realize it. And uh, you can be sinning and not know it. If you sin and know it, that's a different problem. But we're dealing here with sins you can commit and not realize it where you can inadvertently be deceptive, inadvertently be excessively forceful, inadvertently uh, not being a suitable steward when there's something's entrusted to you. You know, it's very strange to me that these issues are very clearly dealt with in the business world. When you're an officer 
or a director of a corporation, the concept of due diligence, the concept of your fiduciary responsibilities are part and parcel of your profession. And they work because they are enforced. That's what lawsuits are all about. In the Christian world, we get all fuzzy about this for several years. First of all, poor training. An awful lot of people who know their Bible have no concept of what the word fiduciary means. And, and, and are, are guilty of the grossest uh, breaches of, of trust. Part of it's poor training. Uh, part of it is a sloppiness in definition. Part of it is, it, well, I could go on. Let's go on. The word koinonia means fellowship or partnership. Uh, it's a fiduciary relationship, which means you put the other person's interest ahead of your own. If you're an officer of a, or a, a director of a corporation, you owe that corporation the duty of putting their interest ahead of your own. And that's why it's very important if you have a conflict of interest. It's not a problem if you have a conflict of interest. It's a problem to have an undisclosed conflict of interest. Corporations get around that by disclosing it. So you know that particular director will abstain from certain issues that go on because he doesn't want to be uh, even the appearance, even the appearance of a conflict. Anyway, in the Christian world, it's <laughs> very different. People steal lists of names. They, I won't go on through all that. It goes on and on. It's good. Verse 3, or have found that which is lost, and lieth concerning it, or swearing falsely, or if any of all of these that a man doeth, sinning therein, and so forth. These are business transactions. They deal with careless custodianship, or common forms of defrauding others, especially when you unknowingly defraud somebody else. Deceit has no place in business, especially in serious business transactions. And even discoveries after the fact are in view here. You may find later that so-and-so was, dis- was defrauded because you didn't make clear some is- issue. You sinned. Verse 4, Then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which was deceitfully gotten, or the thing that was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing that he was that was found, or of all the about which he hath sworn f- uh, falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle. And shall add a fifth part in thereunto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. And shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock, uh, with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord. It shall be forgiven him for anything uh, of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. Again, we have the double tithe involved. You make restitution plus 20%. That was deliberately designed, so not to encourage that kind of thing. So, now obviously many people in Israel, going through all of this, saw no significance of comfort in any of this. And part of that because they didn't have any conviction of sin. And because they had no conviction of sin, they despised all these tedious rituals. None go to a hiding place unless they have fear of the storm. All this makes sense if you really understand how God feels about sin. Uh, there's a proverb that if you read in Proverbs, you may miss the meaning of Proverbs 14.9. says, Fools make a mock of sin, but among righteous there is favor. That doesn't make much sense because it isn't translated quite right. The Septuagint comes closer, gives you a glimpse of what's really involved. Fools make a mock of the trespass offering, but with the righteous it is esteemed. You see, someone that doesn't understand the offerings because he doesn't under, he doesn't understand the remedy because he doesn't understand the disease. And the sense of sin is the measure I suggest of spiritual maturity. And the more you understand how God hates sin, the more precious Jesus Christ is to our soul. As we begin to understand the extremes that God has gone to to clear us of any um, of the stigma and the the disease of sin. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And let's bow our hearts. Father, oh, how we love you, Father. As we begin to understand how hateful How detestable sin is to you, Father. And yet, discovering that that's our nature. A genetic defect that we've inherited from Adam. We understand, Father, that we we sin because we are sinners. 
And yet, you love us. And how astonished we are as we begin to understand how much you hate sin and yet how much you love us. Oh, Father, we we do come before your throne as sinners, acknowledging our sin. And there's so many, Father. Mostly, Father, of ingratitude, presumption, self-will. Oh, Father, pride lies behind all of these. We bring that all before you, the cross, Father. We lay it at the cross. We acknowledge our sinfulness, Father. And as we be, begin to understand these procedures that you highlighted in your word, we begin to understand the innumerable ramifications of that cross. We thank you, Father, that you have provided an offering that is sufficient and complete. That you have gone to such extremes. What for? But to demonstrate your love for us. How can we contain it? So, Father, we thank you for the forgiveness we have in Christ. We thank you for your word that reveals this to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that illuminates this word. And we do pray, Father, that through your word and through your Holy Spirit, you would continue to illuminate that path before us. Help us, Father, to make those choices that would please you. But also, Father, reveal to us those many ways that we have sin that we didn't even realize, we're not even conscious of, that we too might bring those to the cross, Father, specifically. Search our hearts, Father, and show us our secret faults, that these too might be cleansed by pleading the blood that was shed for us. We thank you, Father, for who you are, And we thank you, Father, for what you've done through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.